on behalf of the Institute for Law and Finance, I would you, uh, cordially welcome you to tonight's evening lecture, Brexit First Thoughts for the Financial Service Industry on Economy, Strategy and Law. My name is Rolf Friedewald. I am the Managing Director of the Institute for Law and Finance. Uh, currently, we have 61 students from 22 nations doing a one-year master program or a part-time two-year master program. We're quite proud to every year have so many graduate students come to Frankfurt because this is one of the finest financial capitals in Europe, maybe in the future the finest, but we'll see <laughs> and talk about that tonight. The first thing to realize is that the United Kingdom is a very, very important export market for Germany. In fact, it's the third most important market. So it's more important than China, and it's right behind the US and France. So what, what happens in the UK certainly has a lot of impact on Germany. And it is not only important structurally, if you look at, uh, at the little box there, that the dynamic of exports from Germany to the UK is quite impressive. So it's 11 and 12% over the last two years which puts the UK in the same league as China. And, well, structurally, it's still more important than China. If we dig a bit deeper here and look at the structure of um, EU, German and, and UK trade relations, there's a very clear division of labor. So Germany and Europe exports goods and imports services. So uh, the UK is, is very clearly focused on financial and professional services in its export. The crucial points of the negotiations will really be how to reconcile free movement regulatory convergence as a precondition for services trade on the one hand and the desire to, um, for regulatory autonomy and migration control. To put it positively, um, what we need is a completely new kind of free trade uh, agreement between the EU and UK to make this really happen, but it, won't be, but it won't be easy. So the challenge is how can we take decisions, strategic decisions, on the basis of uncertain facts? And, and Brexit is a perfect example of that. So what do you do? There's actually three things that I would propose uh, that one can do. Uh, first of all, we cannot predict the future, not even the center for the long view. But we can get clarity around the drivers that will drive our future. And uh, if we select the right drivers and uh, combine them in the right way, this is called scenarios. This is what we do in scenario planning. The second step then is to cut through the complexity. There is literally thousands of drivers that can have an important impact on our businesses or our decisions as investors uh, related to Brexit. The, the, the art is to decide which one of those facts are actually important to take decisions which ones are not. And then the third step is to combine the insights from this exercise into the right strategic options. The point of these scenarios is not to predict the future. The point is to show different extreme but plausible scenarios that could happen. So if you remember, the first one was a Europe that is going to disintegrate, but still sticks to the principle of free market. The second scenario, European Federation, was a Europe that is integrating even further at the core, but sticks to the principle of free market. The third scenario, Fortress Europe is turning nasty. So we are integrating, but we're getting nationalistic and protectionist. And the fourth scenario is the worst case scenario, where Europe disintegrates and is falling prey to protectionism. Could those four scenarios happen? I believe yes. Each of them could happen. We see things happening today that could get us in each of those directions. The point of this is that as the facts evolve and politics and economics sort out this mess, we will learn in which direction we are marching. And we can actually measure this. 
it's clear that there is a roadmap to position yourself from a strategic point of view to be ready to take decisions when they're actually due taking. So in the short term, what companies can do and should do right now is to mitigate, to assess, and to prepare. And there's a certain link thing, a list of things that you can do. Then, once we have clarity, once Article 50 is finally triggered or not, and we know how the, in the medium and long run uh, our position is going to be affected, then reposition. Think about your portfolio, about relocation, and your value proposition, how you interact with your clients and with your staff. And then the point I would actually like to make is that Brexit, as any other contextual challenge that is hitting our companies, is actually a chance to transform in the long run. If I understand the risks in the right way, if I cut through the complexity in the right way and make sense of them, and then structure my thinking around what does that mean for my company, and there are templates to do this, there are methods to do this, then it's actually, Brexit becomes not only a great threat, but a great possibility, a great opportunity. So, develop a robust vision of the future, clarify your risk for your company, and then align your company around those strategic actions. And that is easily, well, not easily, but it can be done. The most crucial aspect here, obviously, is the future participation in the common market. So far, the European Union has pointed out that the acceptance of the four freedoms, and that is all four freedoms, including the free movement of workers, is a precondition for any such participation. Brexit, however, mainly occurred due to the alleged missing control as regards the people coming in and working in Britain. Brexiteers mainly seeked for the authority to decide on this exact question without Brussels or the European Court of Justice having the last word. Though the dangers painted during the partly hysterical campaign, ladies and gentlemen, were mostly either unrealistic or pure nonsense, the argument of control or regaining sovereignty dominates the debate until today. Yet regaining complete control on who enters the country and ensuring all four freedoms of the common market obviously do not fit together. And this is also the reason why neither the Norwegian nor the Swiss model are a possible solution for the conflict. Not only do both these countries ensure all four freedoms, they also pay for their participation in the common market. The UK agreeing to such an agreement would be more than absurd. They would then have the same situation as before, but would not be able to influence any of the European legis legislation it would have to transform to domestic law, meaning even less control than before, at probably more or less the same costs, or even more, because Britain is currently profiting from the Britain discount an advantage surely not granted in the coming agreement. So all in all, Theresa May is not to be admired for the position she is in. The, uh, let's say, tricky part is the spin-off of what is in the UK entity. How do we, do we get the branches from the UK entity into um, the new subsidiary? Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, her Majesty's Green and Pleasant Land um, is wonderful and um, very active. Um, they are not as, let's say, creative um, as the German lawmaker. Um, they don't know the, let's say, techniques of spin-off um, and hive down as we uh, know it under German law. But they have invented a comparable scheme, which is called a uh, scheme of arrangements, which allows to avoid asset deals and allow a kind of call it uh, selective universal succession of the rights. So even in the UK we have a tool which allows this succession and uh, we can uh, try at least to use that one. At the very end um, we have a structure uh, which has the original FSI subsidiary of um, a third country, the former FSI in the UK, we have the new subsidiary with the new old branches available. And this is really plain. This is nothing new. This has nothing to do with Brexit.
what I found interesting with Brexit was this direct democracy approach, which is not, uh, let's say, a, a cultural point for the United Kingdom. And I found it very interesting that they, in a way, invented a new way to, uh, let's say, do this. And this is, um, uh, as a great friend of this country, um, a very interesting point how this democratic culture, let's say, uh, develops in, in Britain. This is something new and very interesting. From a theoretical, democratic perspective, the, refer the referendum itself was, was, was um, a catastrophe, in my opinion. An absolute catastrophe. Not, uh, not that saying, not, not as someone who is an opponent of direct democracy, no. But, but direct democracy has, has certain conditions that have to be met before you can actually um, ask a question. And I don't mean that the British people were uh, not intellectual enough to deal with such a question or anything. That's nothing we can bring, against, bring forward against direct democracy, never, ever. But still, the question has to be suitable for a direct democracy. It has to be a yes or no question. And this was not a yes or no question, because it was a yes, but how will we remain with our European partners? That was the question. And the second part of this question, everyone who wrote it Brexit had another idea of how the relationship is going to end up. That was the problem. And that was actually the, uh, the, the problem coming up after uh, Mr. Boris Johnson then resigned and they all left sort of uh, after, right, directly afterwards because every, nobody knew what was going to come and that was the actual question that was asked. So from a democratic perspective, I found that this was indeed not a good referendum. Second point, democratic decisions taken by the people have to be um, able to be transformed into a real decision quickly. They have to be, the best thing would be if the decision itself was taken on Monday and on Tuesday the decision was implemented. That's the best thing to have, because then the people really feel that I've decided something. But what, what's, what's happening with Brexit? We don't know nothing, actually. Uh, we don't know when it's going to come, we don't know if it's going to come, we don't know how it's going to come. So people who voted Brexit feel, we didn't decide this because it's going to be decided in the agreement. And how this agreement is going to look like, we don't have a clue. And if it's going to fit or match our expectations, we don't have a clue. So what was a good referendum was the Hamburg referendum on the question whether to apply for the Olympics 2024. Because uh, the next day, the, the mayor of Hamburg then took the application and threw it in the rubbish. That was a good decision to take by public vote, not Brexit. Once we have an agreement in, I don't know, two, three, four, five years, then it might be also from a democratic point of view quite suitable to have a second referendum because then people would know what they, what they are voting for. Then you have very concrete alternatives. In this case, you had a clear alternative, leave, and a very unclear alternative where to go. And I think this, this, this is the only scenario I can imagine where, where, where a second referendum might make sense. Yes, actually, it's, it, it intrigues me what you said about actually don't know anything about Brexit. Uh, getting one step closer to home, back again, there's a number of things we know for certain now. One is that the European Union as it is right now needs reform and will be reformed. And, and, and I, I think that that is already a, a, a big happening, a, a big thing for, for, for us, so that we can be certain that over the next couple of years there will be a period of introspection, not only in the UK, but also here in, in Europe, how we want to sort ourselves out and how we want to organize our, our race publica. 